on our way to a clinic here in Melbourne to see Simon Sostrick, who was a physiologist that helped me prepare for hot races, basically, because in former 3000, in Monte Carlo, I had a very bad experience where I was underprepared. I just basically drank way too much water, and I crashed the car at the end of the, the race purely because I washed myself of a lot of nutrients, and I was also very, very hot as well. So we put a bit of science in place, and in the end, I really enjoyed the challenge of preparing myself and making sure that I left no stone unturned in my preparation. As a Formula One driver, there's some very, very hot races on the calendar. Malaysia, some really naughty ones. And today I'm going to explain to you how I used to prepare as a Grand Prix driver. Knock, knock. How are you, mate? Good to see you. Yeah, you yeah. too. How are you? Good. Ready for another session? Yeah. Even as a fan growing up watching Formula One, you used to see these drivers completely cooked and uncomfortable. PK up on the rostrum is looking very, very dodgy indeed. He's fainting. These guys still didn't really understand how they could prepare better to make themselves feel comfortable at the end of a Grand Prix, and that was going to equal in performance and lap time, which the engineers weren't really interested in in terms of helping us, but we had to go and help ourselves. And science has moved on a long way. People like Simon now are really helping us guys feel more comfortable in the car in those extreme temperatures. One of the absolute key ingredients for Simon to understand how I was feeling was this pill. So basically it's just simply a thermometer. You swallow it and we can pick up that signal by telemetry. Stripped off. Uh, I'm about to put on some uh, extra gear. This was actually developed by Victoria's Secret, believe it or not. It helps carry the logger, which will talk to the pill. Another very, very important layer is what we call skin folds. So when we talk about drivers being fit and prepared, this has a double effect because it's weight that we don't want to carry in the car, but also fat is an insulator, so we get hot quicker. So it's in our interest for the hot races to make sure that we're very, very lean, and they actually measure to the nearest millimetre how much fat you're carrying on your body. There's several Formula One drivers on the grid that take this quite seriously, and there's several Formula One drivers that don't, even to this day, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and it's pretty easy to see the ones that aren't. So how much fat have I put on mate since I stopped racing? You're coming in at 5% body fat, so about a percent body fat up on uh, what you've been at your leanest. So we're set up doing a typical heat acclimation training session, so we know we can elicit really good core temperature changes in a short period of time when the exercise intensity is high. And this is also a protocol that fits in nicely with a hectic schedule that someone like Mark has. Modern Formula One now, I mean, God, it's moved on a lot. There was a huge lag, and still is to a degree, the amount of effort they put into understanding what the car's doing, but the driver was a very small factor of that up until the last few years. So you look at Mansell in Dallas. Surely that's too much even for him. These hot, hot races back in the day were very, very difficult for these guys to get the car home. And it is, he's fainted. Oh, very strong night here, 9G, didn't pass out, I was unconscious. Through Beckett's, come back around on the exit, finish the lap, passed 18 cars on one lap, had a puncher too. And Nigel Mansell wins! The top end teams obviously are starting to put a little bit more focus on this too because they understand it, but still you have to respect the heat at the end of the day. The heat is what really makes us get quite tired at the end of the race, mentally as well as just getting cooked in the car. When we have a look at uh, how marathon runners and Ironman triathletes prepare, it's very similar to how he prepares. Uh, the very difference here though in these peaks in core temperature is that there's no opportunity to really have that effective loss of sweat of the skin to cool down. Balaclava, helmet, seat belt, up against the seat, there's not much circulation behind, there's a huge amount of skin that's on the back of the seat, no circulation there, the race suit, the boots, it's not a very comfortable environment. If you're not replacing all these fluids that are being lost, plus it's not evaporating off your skin, it's, it's being absorbed by the racing suit or it's dripping off, then your core temperature will just continue to rise. Once you start getting over 40 degrees Celsius, you're well and truly in that exertional hypothermic range, left unmanaged, that can lead on to heat stroke, which can be catastrophic. There, people die of heat stroke. 
Uh, these guys are as prepared as they can be to deal with this environment. And in a race, in a very challenging environment like Malaysia, Mark will typically be in the 40 to 41 degree Celsius core temperature range. There's enough going on on a race weekend to not have to worry about a distraction like am I ready for a tough Grand Prix. Go to the paddy club, Mark. Can you go to the paddy club, please? We want you to go there after the race and talk to the press about how awesome the race was. Well, I don't want to. I want to, I want to recover. OK, so here's a vial of my blood. It was taken a while ago. People are talking about we might need to go there early. How do we adapt for a race? How does the body prepare for a hot race like that? Well, in this case, you can see the plasma in the blood uh, has increased, if you like. So when you're in those environments, your plasma will increase in the blood and you will be in a better position to perform in a better way. With heat acclimation, one of the key adaptations is that that volume there, that watery substance expands, so that increases in volume. With that increase in volume, not only do you have a larger blood volume, so you've got more blood that can be distributed around the body to the working muscle, to the organs, the brain, but you also have more fluid available in a way that helps your hydration status, for example. In sports and in Formula One, there could be a case that people could take advantage of the rules and cheat with this. That's exactly right. So there are some medications around now which are generically called plasma volume expanders. It would be, and is considered a form of cheating, so the natural way to do it, or the best way you can do it by natural means, or as natural as possible, is by some heat acclimation training protocols. Hence why it's also important that we get drug tested for the naughty boys to get cleaned up, which uh, never happens, which is good in our sport. So. We're about to get into the little pool that we used to take to some of our races. It uh, looks very straightforward, because it is. It's just a huge amount of water uh, in a little pool and I would use this before a Grand Prix, after a Grand Prix to get myself in a much much more comfortable environment. Given all the effort that goes into the car, they uh, sometimes as a culture in Formula 1 the driver uh, preparation wasn't quite as important come race day, which it was. So you always hear in Malaysia someone faints on the grid, generally the boys pushing the car to the grid. They're not athletes obviously so it's a very very tough environment for them but I'm sitting in the car going guys I am absolutely cool as a cucumber ready to go after being in this environment. 